you'll notice that from the start, just like in k-means, we decide how many Gaussians we're going to be fitting. Just like k-means, we said that we're going to have, say, you know, two clusters or ten clusters. Uh, here you need to do the same thing. Um, and in many cases, you might want to sort of discover, well, how many Gaussians are enough? How many should I be using? Should I be using ten? Should I be using a thousand? What's the right number for my data set? Um, and the answer here is not much more clear than for k-means. Uh, you have slightly different methods, slightly more powerful methods, and, that, uh, and, and that's because um, Gaussian mixtures and EM in general, uh, it's a probabilistic model, so you have a better defined objective function. So um, when, when you're fitting a mixture model, what you're trying to do is you're trying to maximize the likelihood or the log, log likelihood of your data under the assumption that it's generated from a mixture model. So you have a mixture of uh, k components and uh, what you're doing is you're effectively measuring what's the probability that each instance xi came from the kth component multiplied by the prior for that component, add it all up, so that's the total probability for xi, and then add or multiply them together or add their logs over all the instances that you have. So that's a log likelihood of the data, assuming that it came from those Gaussians. So uh, now what you could try to do is you could try to say, well, um, I want to maximize the likelihood. I want to make this likelihood as large as it can possibly get, because that indicates if the likelihood is large, this means that my model, my mixture of Gaussians, fits the data well. So um, you could try to use that directly uh, to maximize k, basically run it with different values of k, and then see which one gives you the best result. Uh, the problem, though, is that this is going to be maximized when each instance has its own little Gaussian dedicated to it. So that's the same argument that we had in k-means. So uh, the highest likelihood you can get is when for each data point there is a separate little Gaussian sit on a, sit, sitting on top of that data point and giving it a high probability mass. So that's when you're going to get a high likelihood, and of course that's not a very useful mixture. So you, wanna, you maybe want to come up with something better. Um, you could try to use a training set and a validation set. So this would measure how well does this mixture generalize to new data that I'm going to see tomorrow. And uh, in some domains this will work, but for many other domains uh, you are still going to get best result when k, the number of components in the mixture, is very, very large. So maybe, uh, maybe n, which is the number of training instances, instances in your training set. So if you use this directly, you're still going to end up with a, Gau w with a mixture model that has lots and lots of Gaussians, many more than you would like to have. Uh, so how do you get around this? Uh, if you're following the book, the book advocates a couple of metrics here. Uh, so they're sensible metrics. They, they have a nice interpretation. Um, in practice, how well they work in practice is sort of a different question. So um, the, the, the interpretation, the intuition that you want to use here is that of the Occam's razor, right? So Occam's razor says that if you've got a bunch of data uh, and you have multiple hypotheses that could explain what's happening in your data, you should pick the simplest possible explanation. So the idea is, you know, you can have a complicated explanation for something, you can have a simple explanation for something. If they both explain it equally well, you should go for the simpler one, because it's less likely to, be, to go wrong somewhere in the details. So, you know, keep, keep it simple, in a way. Um, so uh, there are two ways to encode it. So a Kaike information criterion, uh, basically what you're doing here is you're trying to define simple uh, in terms of uh, mixture models. So um, now, uh, it has two parts, P and L. So P is a measure of how simple the model is, and uh, the way you compute it is you look at the total number of parameters that your model has. Now, uh, so let's think, about, let's think about a simple example, one-dimensional Gaussian, right? Let's say I'm fitting two one-dimensional Gaussians. How many parameters do I have? So four, six, it's actually five. It's in, it's in the middle. <laughs> so uh, I have the mean 
for each Gaussian, right? I have the variance for each Gaussian, and then I have a mixture component, the, the, the prior. Uh, and when you have two Gaussians, you only have one mixture component, because the other one is just one minus two. Right? So, um, so you have five. So that would be your P for two Gaussians in one dimension. And if you have, if you have a d-dimensional <coughs> space, then <coughs> the number of parameters is actually quadratic, because the covariance matrix is uh, square in the number of dimensions. Um, so that's how you determine P. Uh, and then L is the likelihood. Right? So what you're doing is you're saying L is a measure of how well our model fits the data. And the more components you throw at it, the bigger L is going to be, because it's going to fit the data better and better and better. Um, and uh, P is how complicated the model is, how many parameters you need to estimate for the model. So the more components you throw into the mixture, the more parameters you're going to have to uh, estimate. So, uh, and in both cases, whether it's Bayes information criterion or a Kaiki AAC or BAC, you're trying to maximize the quantity. So you're trying to make L big, right? So the minimum of minus L is... Um, you're making it big, you, you want to make the model fit the data, and you want to make P relatively small because you want the model to be as simple as possible. And this is a way to pick a trade-off, or one way to pick a trade-off between the complexity of the model, number of parameters, and how well it explains your data, the likelihood. So um, um, it's a really nice explanation. It's a, it's a feel-good kind of explanation. You read it and you say, ah, oh, this makes sense to me. Now I understand how to pick K. Uh, in practice, you use it. It's going to give you a number. Uh, you can use that number to pick K, and whether you're going to be happy with that K or not uh, really varies, right? Because this, these, they have some theory behind them, but they're really rather arbitrary. So um, if you are not using a mixture model just for the purpose of using the mixture model, you are much better off uh, uh, doing, uh, doing the validation thing, right? So uh, train it with different K, see what the error is on the validation set, or better yet, uh, you're probably you're probably you're probably doing it to construct a new representation for your classifier. So take your classifier and see how well it works on the output of a mixture model over different values of k, and then pick the best k that way rather than using one of these because these are not going to be optimal for that. Okay. Um, all right, so let's, uh, let's summarize. We talked about mixture models, talked about the EM algorithm. We walked through a uh, 1D version, uh, and, and we had an example for multiple dimensions. You can use it for real-valued data. If you do that, you use Gaussians. You can use it for discrete data. And there, instead of Gaussians, you would use multinomial distributions. And there are many examples uh, of models like that. It's a probabilistic model, so it tries to fit the likelihood, which makes it uh, nice. Uh, it is similar to k-means in many, many ways. So um, it is sensitive to starting points. So depending on where you start, you will end up in different, uh, in different, uh, in, in different configurations with different parameters for the Gaussians. So the objective is not convex. Uh, you're not always going to get to the same point. You will get to different points depending on where you start with. Um, <clears throat> uh, there is no natural stopping point. In k-means, you stop when the points don't change places. Here, there is no hard assignment of points to Gaussians, so uh, what you have to do is you have to basically put a threshold. And once the probabilities, once none of the probabilities change more than by a certain amount, then you decide to stop. Or if you have a big data set, you just run it for five iterations or however much, uh, however much you have time for. Um, and uh, for k, you have a couple of ways of picking it, but it's not, uh, I guess, it's, it's, it's not much easier than with k-means. So how is it different from k-means? Uh, it is soft clustering, right? So you're not, you're not doing a hard assignment of one data point to one cluster. Each, point, each data point belongs to all the Gaussians to some degree. Um, and the really big difference is you're estimating the covariance. And one way to think about what the estimate of variance does is um, as you are re-estimating the variance of each Gaussian, you're basically changing your definition of a distance between a centroid, which is the mean of the Gaussian, and each data instance. So you are, you're changing your distance function as the algorithm progresses. So um, a, good, a good question to ask yourself, you know, suppose you wanted, how can, how can you cripple 
a mixture model to become exactly like k-means. Right. So what would you have to do to get the same output from a Gaussian mixture as you would from k-means? Any ideas? The variance must be all, uh, almost zero. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, not sure that would do it by itself. But what would do it is if you just didn't recompute the variance. If you pegged the variance to 1 for everything, and you pegged the priors to be uniform, then the output of a Gaussian mixture model is going to be identical to the output of the k-means clustering algorithm. 